I'd now like to introduce our, our second speaker this afternoon. Dr. Gary Dunn received his PhD in clinical and social psychology from Hofstra University and is a licensed psychologist who has been working in mental health, hospital, and educational, educational settings for more than 30 years. Since 2011, he has been the director of CAPS, which is the counseling and psychological services at UC Santa Cruz. Prior to coming to Santa Cruz, he served as the director of a hospital-based community mental health center in New York and oversaw psychological services at a large tertiary care hospital in North Carolina. Dr. Dunn's primary training is in cognitive behavioral therapy and strategic therapy. He's also interested in health psychology, healthcare administration, and leadership development. Recent areas of interest include understanding anxiety amongst college students, addressing suicidal thoughts and behaviors of college students, and developing a college counseling center to meet diverse multicultural and intersectional needs. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gary Dunn. All right, well, good afternoon. And uh, I do want to thank the, uh, the organizers of this, this uh, symposium. It's definitely a favorite of mine. And I really see it as an opportunity for mental health professionals, other helping professionals throughout Santa Cruz County and neighborhood uh, counties to get together and to learn and to mingle and to reconnect with old friends and colleagues. So thank you, thank you all for what you do. It's greatly appreciated. Uh, so these are the questions that um, I want to ponder uh, for the next uh, few minutes today. Is anxiety increasing in college students? I imagine you have a good guess on that. Um, if so, why? I want to drill down to how are we doing in the University of California? How about uh, UC Santa Cruz specifically? What's the impact of identities on this? How do we assess for this? Uh, how are we treating anxiety? And what research is being conducted? So. Uh, I'm going to be referencing a number of different data sources and trying to be uh, uh, empirical in this discussion. And I want you to understand where some of this information is coming from. So one is the National College Health Assessment. And actually, uh, this is something that happens throughout the country. And all the UCs participate. It happens that, that this year, for the first time, we actually got our acts together and all did the assessment in the spring of uh, 2019. So it gives us an opportunity to benchmark against each other and compare and contrast, which is always helpful. Uh, the, uh, the Counseling Center Assessment of Psychological Symptoms is the CCAPS, and that's another national measure that actually comes out of the Center for Collegiate Mental Health that uh, that measures uh, outcomes in, in, for the students who come into counseling programs. So this is something several years ago, all the UCs got together and agreed we were gonna give this to students every time they had a counseling session so that we could see not only how they're coming into us, but how they're progressing. Uh, also that CCMH, uh, has another index called the clinical index of uh, clinician index of clinical concern. I'll be mentioning it's the Healthy Minds survey. Um, the student questionnaire is another local form. It's a form that students complete when starting services at CAPS throughout the UC system. And again, we were able to coordinate uh, um, six or seven years ago and come up with a form that we would give to uh, students that was consistent across the board so that we can get a sense of, of how we're doing uh, compared to each other and as a group. And uh, the GAD-7 is a, a generalized anxiety measure that we'll use from time to time. So, okay, uh, so nationally, the percentage of students who are uh, report being diagnosed or treated for anxiety disorders, these are college students, in the last 12 months doubled between 2008 and 2016. That's from NCHA. Uh, scores for students who present to college counseling centers have increased steadily uh, in generalized anxiety, social anxiety, and depression. And that's that CCAPS that I mentioned that we give to the students who come into counseling. So the difference is the first number that NCHA data is from the general population, all students, whereas the CCAPS are students who are coming in and asking for help. 
Um, and then the Healthy Mind Survey, which is also more general, found um, college and uh, graduate students screened positively for anxiety rose from 17% to 26%. Uh, so that uh, clinician index that I mentioned, so what are we seeing on that? Uh, anxiety was reported as one of the top concerns for almost 63% of the students who were coming in to counseling, uh, almost 44% were stressed. And the top concern was also anxiety, 23.5. And it broke down, that 23.5 broke down, as you see, with the majority being generalized anxiety. And those represent other diagnosable anxiety conditions, social anxiety, panic, um, other test anxieties, not a diagnosis per se, and uh, specific phobias. So. Um, this is more general, the 12-month prevalence of an anxiety disorder, 18 to 29-year-olds was 22% in 2007. Now we're trending closer to 40%. And it grew uh, more than two times as fast as all other mental disorders, and it holds the dubious distinction of expanding more quickly than other mental health disorders, pointing to a singular and pressing issue on college campuses. And as a general fact, teenagers report higher levels of stress than adults, and I think that's something we've gotten the impression from uh, all our previous speakers. Okay, so how about the University of California? Uh, the rate increased even higher, nearly two, two and a half times higher in 2016 than 2008, and that's again general data. So on that general data, uh, this was just from spring of, of 2019. So uh, students reported uh, in the last 30 days, 73% overwhelmed by all they had to do. 72% felt exhausted, not from physical activity. 49% felt very lonely. 53% felt very sad. 46% felt overwhelming anxiety. So. I've thrown a lot of numbers at you in a short period of time, but I want to pause on that and just have you reflect on that, what that's saying. So this is just an average student who chooses to participate in this survey, not somebody who's coming into counseling. So what we're saying here is that 53% felt very sad and 49% very lonely and 46% overwhelming anxiety. So between 50 and 70 percent of, of students are having these experiences in the last 30 days. So that's just, to, in my mind, overwhelming. And it really, you have to stop and think, well, how are you going, it's an epidemic, right? How are you going to respond to that sort of information? Because it's probably not going to be providing individual therapy for everyone. Right? That's just not going to be a possibility. We have 19,000 students, for instance, on UC, UC Santa Cruz. And this is, this is uh, throughout the UC system. Unfortunately, our campus, the numbers are actually uh, more concerning. So some other pieces um, from that same study. Uh, these, these are the things that were very traumatic or difficult to handle. Uh, Career-related issues, death of a family member, family problems, uh, intimate relationships, other relationships, finances, personal appearance, personal health. Sleep came up uh, earlier today from Jean, so almost 36% were found their sleep situation to be traumatic or difficult to handle. Um, and they found these, these things affected their academic performance, again, sleep, stress, work, anxiety, concern for a troubled friend, depression, internet use computer games, and relationship difficulties. You know, it's interesting, based on the talk, you would think that that number for internet use computer games would be higher, but um, like substance abuse, it's not what students come in and tell us about all the time. They're not like, hey, you know, I'm here because I'm drinking too much or I'm worried about my internet use. That comes out but it's not necessarily their presenting problem, per se. Uh, so yeah, underreported on that one, to be sure. OK, so I mentioned this, this CCAP. So this is this measure that 
we give to students uh, every time we see them when they come into counseling services. And this is specifically now talks about our students at UC Santa Cruz. So we're higher than the national average on depression, generalized anxiety, and social anxiety. We also have another dubious distinction of being the highest uh, in the UC system and way higher than national average on I have thoughts of ending my life. 49% um, scored greater than zero. So we see about 3,000 students a year, so do the math. Uh, now just to break that down, to be clear, is so that's anybody who scores greater than one on this Likert scale. Uh, so that 49% is made up of 20% of our students who scored a one, 13% scored a two, 10% uh, uh, scored a three, and 6% scored a four. So thankfully it's not the other way around. So uh, Berkeley is, uh, has been doing a study, a, a, a professor named uh, Richard Scheffler in the School of Public Policy, looking at, uh, looking at anxiety and social anxiety. And by the way, I don't think it's been studied that much, certainly not among college students. I, I think that, that the recognition that this is a mental health crisis has is, is been slow to be picked up and, and people are, are really first starting to look at it from what I can see. But uh, they have been doing a study for the last couple of years and it's not published yet, but I did get permission to share some of their information. And um, they found all of the following to be positively correlated with anxiety disorder in the UC system, the CSU system, and all campuses. So. They found correlations with, uh, and again, not causation, uh, with substance abuse, prescription drug abuse, alcohol use, negative consequences from alcohol use, attempted suicide, serious consideration of suicide, and sexual assault. UC students also uh, seen with anxiety disorder were nearly nine times as likely to be diagnosed with a substance abuse or addiction, and CSU students were five times uh, more likely the national was over three times. So we see this interesting thing where UC students uh, in many ways seem more acute in some of these areas. Uh, so I mentioned the student questionnaire data. So this is, every time uh, we start with a student, it's like a, an intake form that students complete. And this is the one that we use uh, throughout the UC system. So we see the top primary concerns. We, uh, we give them a list and say, you know, check off as, as many of these as you want, and then which one is your top one, secondary, tertiary, like that. So uh, top primary concern is anxiety disorder, and the top secondary concern is also anxiety disorder. And stress is in there as well. So it's really most of what we're getting reported by this. This is what the students tell us when they come in. So I wanted to look at the uh, impact of identities. So uh, the rate of anxiety disorder for female identified students was over twice that of male identified students, 23% to 10%. The rate of increase uh, from 2008 to 2016 was 65% for transgender students. So they went from 34 to 56% anxiety disorder. Um, and there was a 67% increase for male students and a 92% increase for female students. Um, the rate of increase um, was 150% for Asian or Pacific Islander students, 180% for black students, 150 for Latinx students, uh, 109 for white students. So, but you see the absolute number, white students reported the highest rate of anxiety disorder at 23% while Asian and Pacific Islander students reported the lowest rate at 10%. And important to note that the differences in cultural attitudes and access to mental health care are important considerations uh, to consider. So according to a recent study, black and Hispanic students had, a lower rate, had lower rates of psychiatric diagnoses than white students, but at similar rates of past year suicide attempts. Okay, so I wanna shift to 
why this might be going on and some thoughts. So another study, the National uh, Longitudinal Survey of Youth found the following associations, not causations, but that young adults with uh, mothers that had a mental disorder were more likely to have an anxiety disorder. Perhaps this supports a genetic link. Uh, this was kind of an, uh, an odd artifact, artifact uh, that young adults with mothers that have at least an undergraduate degree were 45% uh, percent more likely than those without a college degree. Uh, yeah, interesting. Young adults in households that have difficulty paying bills, that makes sense, 1.3 times more likely, and it supports financial stress, increases anxiety, and young adults in the top quartile of computer use, leisure time, which includes cell phones, uh, above 20 hours per week, we're 54% more likely to have anxiety than the bottom quartile. And that supports a lot of what we've been talking about today. And I do want to dive into that a little deeper. And some of it is reinforcing uh, what's already been talked about by our presenters. And some maybe looks at it from a slightly different perspective. Um, so uh, you might have seen some of this already today, uh, this common sense media reports um, and Pew Research reports. So I can skip over that. Um, in terms of use. This is interesting. So Nancy Cheever is a psychologist from CSU Dominguez Hills. Any Dominguez Hills uh, folks out there? No? No cheers on that one? All right. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, her theory is that phone-induced phone anxiety operates on a positive feedback loop. So it keeps us in a persistent state of anxiety with the only relief being looking at the phone. That relieves our anxiety, then the anxiety builds up, and we reduce that anxiety by engaging with the phone. You saw that on that clip that Paul showed. Um, she did an interesting study uh, where she set up, uh, the, the setup of the study was that she was looking at test anxiety. That's not really what she was looking at. She brought, she brought uh, students in and and hooked them up to EKG monitors to measure their heart rate. And then said, you know, so that they don't interfere with the mechanisms here, we're just gonna take your cell phones. And, uh, and they took the cell phones and put them just kind of, you know, out of reach, but not out of uh, hearing. And then they, and then they started calling those cell phones, right? And they were literally measuring the autonomic response of the students as those cell phones were going off and they couldn't go to them. And they just you know, found that, that the stress levels were, were off the charts on that. Um, so I, I also found that, that uh, some of our uh, uh, colleagues in other countries are doing a lot of important research in this area, maybe a little more than we're getting into. And so a study was done by a group in Serbia and Italy, and it's interesting uh, all in all, but uh, one of the pieces was that uh, supports what we've been hearing is that the strongest predictor of high stress levels uh, was keeping the mobile phone less than one meter away during sleep. So they found that that, that was the cutoff. It was, if it was further than that, maybe the stress level wasn't as high. If it was essentially within reaching distance. And I also found that 65% of us sleep with or next to our cell phones, right? So, and among college students, it's even higher. Uh, so uh, I had a thought about that, and we, we've also thought about why that might be the case. I think that that we can develop a psychological link with our phone, and that if it's with us all the time, and we're just we're just connected to it, and that that act of taking that phone and whether we're you know locking it away somewhere or putting it downstairs or at least the other side of the room, it it allows us that separation and individuation, if you will, from our phones, right? <laughs> And, 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 um, and maybe that's what we need to do because, uh, again, from different perspectives, I'm, I'm hearing the same thing and it's, it's a fairly easy behavioral change that we can make that for ourselves and for the people we're working with. So think about that. Um, so this is a study out of Oxford in England and, um, 
And they came up with, uh, they call it the digital Goldilocks hypothesis, right? Remember Goldilocks? And, um, and so they found that the, a moderate use of digital technology is not intrinsically harmful and may be advantageous in a, in a connected world. Uh, but that overuse may displace alternative activities. Too little tech use may, might deprive young people of important social information. And uh, in the study, they, they found certain in what they call inflection points, the point at which it went from being helpful to being harmful. So on the weekends, you could do more and it was still helpful because you were socializing and doing things like that. During the week when you were supposed to be in school and, and attending to other activities, that inflection point was lower. And they also broke it up by the types of, um, of use, uh, whether it was gaming or texting and those kind of things. Um, and they found smartphone use and video games had lower inflection points on weekends. So that was more quickly, if you're using your phone for those things, that, that, that point in the number of minutes that you can engage with the phone before it, it, it was tending more negative than positive um, was lower. So um, yeah, and, and they did try to emphasize, and I think it's important uh, that you know, we not come off as too judgmental about this whole thing. I mean, this is the reality that we're living in, and and there are some uh, that have been articulated already, some really positives from our technology. And 83% uh, of adolescents say that social media makes them feel more connected to friends. 68% uh, receive social support through digital technologies in tough or challenging times. So. Maybe something to consider this, uh, this Goldilocks hypothesis that, that sort of abstinence or just total removal is not always the best solution, but finding some kind of moderate use would be a better way to go. So um, Paul had gotten into this about addictions, uh, just to reinforce it a little bit, um, that, you know, here are some, some other things that you know, might be an indication that, that this is a problem for somebody, texting and driving, causing family conflict, causing functional impairments, compulsive checking, causing sleep disturbance, or uh, anxiety or irritability if not accessible. Have any of you heard the term nomophobia? So what we need is another phobia, right? Is, uh, so that's actually a term that's being used for no mobile phone phobia. And it's the irrational fear of being without your mobile phone or being unable to use your phone for some reason, such as the absence of a signal or running out of minutes or battery power. So just to be clear, this is not a DSM-5 diagnosis, uh, but, um, but it is a reality. And, and the numbers that they were hypothesizing of people who actually experience some form of nomophobia is, uh, is really quite high. And we also heard, do you remember what this is, FOMO? Fear of, fear of missing out, right? There's another study, actually I just saw this, is a recent study out of China looking at undergraduate students. And they looked at the relationship between what they termed uh, problematic smartphone use in depression and anxiety. So they defined problematic smartphone use as entails addictive use, prohibited use, and, the, and risky behaviors. Addictive use is linked to excessive reassurance sought uh, via smartphone use. Uh, internalized psychopathology did not predict smartphone addiction. But they did find that the fear of missing out may be an important variable accounting uh, for why some types of psychopathology, like anxiety, are associated with problematic smartphone use. So shorthand for that is, yeah, that fear of missing out uh, does, does predict when smartphone use can cause anxiety. Other causes, when clearly it's not all about cell phone use, the anxiety we're seeing, um, gun violence, you know, 75% of Gen Z, um, what we're supposed to call them now, iGens, so okay, uh, report that, um, that math sh mass shootings are a significant source of stress. 
72% are worried about possible school shootings. Something they found from the Berkeley study, academic pressure, pressures, finances, uh, uh, big cause of anxiety, uh, environmental stressors. Uh, more than two-thirds of Americans are stressed about the direction of our country. I'd have to think that was more like four out of five. I don't know, I don't know who that fifth person is either, but that's a whole other story. Um, yeah, and, and, and on college campuses where we have this, we have stress related to uh, institutional racism. We have stress related to uh, what our DACA students are going through, um, what our uh, LGBT students go through, what our first generation students deal with. So, um, and other, other demographic variables, a changing demographic that we're seeing in college campus uh, across the board and certainly in the UC system, which is great and it's a much more diverse population than we've ever had, but it also brings other challenges. Um, one of which is poverty and 20% uh, of dependent undergraduates were fr uh, from families in poverty and that is up from 12% in 1996. So the good news is higher percentage of students who are uh, in poverty are, are getting to universities. But it's also, again, causing more challenges and um, we have other causes. Uh, I'm sure you've seen some of the issues that we're dealing with um, with our graduate students and in UC Santa Cruz right now and that, uh, yeah, it's a challenge and, and tough situation that graduate students are in with, with cost of living and, and then our undergraduates are impacted by not having graduate students around. It's, uh, I don't know how that's going to resolve and, and of course the coronavirus is starting to create more and more stress on campus. So just some day-to-day -day problems that we're seeing. Um, this was interesting and um, I think really supports what, what Gene was talking about. And um, this is a guy named uh, Jonathan Haidt who wrote a book called Coddling of the American Mind. And his theory is that children are, he uses the term anti-fragile and they need to have experiences to go strong. And, and we've been treating them as if they're fragile trying to protect them and help them avoid problems and failures and, uh, and concerns. And that by trying to eliminate risk from our kids, we're doing a disservice. This next stat actually we all seem to pick up on. And, um, but I thought it's interesting to look at that the average life experience of Gen Z going to college is, a, is equivalent to that of a 15 year old 30 to 40 years ago. So. Think if, if you're of, let's say, a, a generation like mine, uh, think about what it would have been like for you to go to college at 15 instead of at, at 18 and how well you would have fared. And that gives you an idea what the experience of our students is today. Um, and this all coincides with the whole social media piece and children being exposed to an often harsh environment at a young age without any preparation for it. So um, check out Jonathan Haidt if you want to find out more about that. I wanted to touch briefly, how are we doing on time here, by the way? Five? Okay. So um, let me cruise quickly through, um, through this assessment piece. So. You know, anxiety is, is, is a behaviorally uh, driven disorder, so it's not that hard to assess in that it's not hidden, people, it creates a lot of discomfort and if you ask people about it, they'll tell you about their panic and, and their worry, et cetera. So, uh, so clinical interview is really the main, the, the main tool. You can use a structured interview, there's various other um, measures that that you can use if you want to track over time, and that's a good idea to look at change. Um, the, um, what, I, what I wanted to emphasize here in my, my last piece is that uh, because of the prevalence of this, we've really started to think about 
uh, environmental interventions. And it sounds like um, Valerie was talking about a similar thing, which I'm thrilled to hear, you know, at, in lower schools. So this is a picture of uh, UC Davis. Any uh, Davis folks out there? Yeah, a couple? Um, all right. So they've act th these are nap pods that are indicated up there. So they have places where students can just take a nap. So right, so we talked about like sleep being the big thing. Well, let's find a place for students to sleep. Uh, this is, um, we don't have time to watch this, but this is from uh, uh, CSU Long Beach and where they've developed a, a, an oasis center. It's, kind of, it's like a wellness center. It's a cell phone free zone, by the way. You leave your phone at the door and it has meditation space. It has um, a labyrinth. It's, um, it's really quite a, quite a relaxing, lovely space for the students. And I think this is a direction we need to go in to create uh, a better environment. So, thank you. Uh, also, th this idea of, of learning how to fail. So, you know, we have a resilience initiative on our campus, uh, we're following in the footsteps of of other universities, including Stanford, that did a, uh, a resilience project where they worked to normalize failure. Several other schools did that too, and um, and we're working on developing uh, right now a resilience initiative on our campus. Uh, some other things that we're doing again to get to the the vast number of students who need help is focusing more on our online service. So we use, um, we use an instrument called uh, TAU, which is Therapist Assistance Online. And this is actually evidence-based. And there's a lot of mental health apps out there that aren't necessarily scientifically studied. This one is, um, and we use, we use others as well. Uh, these are just some clinical interventions that are part of our services at, at CAPS. And uh, we've recently started this uh, anxiety toolbox, which is uh, three, three sessions of group therapy that are really psychoeducational, and they're really taking off on our campus. We can start them throughout the quarter, and uh, more and more students are coming in. We also work with peers to, to uh, train them how to work with students, and psychopharmacology, case management, mindfulness, uh, social anxiety group, so all these things we have going. Um, just quickly here, that, that is prob, uh, uh, problematic smartphone use, the PSPU, and um, so how do you, so what do you do about it? it? You know, really hasn't been extensively studied that I could see. Ironically, there's been many apps developed to help limit use. <laughs> I thought that was kind of cute. Um, and, but here's some potentially useful ideas uh, that you might offer to somebody who's struggling with this. You know, not always answering your phone by turning off some alerts, or setting limits about not using a phone during certain situations or time, deleting old apps, unfollowing news feeds and friends that don't contribute usefully, uh, cleaning up email subscriptions, moving a cell phone away from bed while sleeping, let's do that. Uh, balancing screen time and in-person time and um, trying a technology fast. I've had this fantasy about if we could only get maybe everybody on campus to close off their phones for five minutes together, what an empowering moment that would be. I don't think I'll ever get there, but I can dream. Um, but I do, you know, one of my, the more distressing things is when I leave work every day and I see, uh, you know, 50 students waiting for the bus and they're all just looking at their phones. And, you know, and then we know that social anxiety is a major piece that we're dealing with. Well, maybe if we started talking to each other a little bit, we might do a little better in that area. Um, we are investigating a lot of this. Um, uh, where I'm working with the research team now and trying to understand why our students seem more impacted by mental health concerns. Uh, we're starting to look at this UC-wide data, what we can learn from that. Uh, there's a, a professor in the psychology department who we're working with to uh, better understand and utilize on live, online options, options and how we can improve digital hygiene. and. Uh, 
what are the impacts of the resilience-based efforts that we're working on, and, uh, and what can faculty or academic departments do differently to help reduce student stress. And, and that's a really big piece. Another environmental stressor is how, how we structure the classes, uh, how we structure the, the exams. Um, uh, what what our expectations are and you know frankly in, at UCSC we haven't done a great job of considering the impact uh, of on the mental health of our students in a lot of those decisions so given the extent of the problems we're starting to look at that and think about new innovative ways to, to teach our students and, and incorporating this in so that's all for me you know this is a picture of um, of what I'm blessed to see every day as I drive off campus. And, um, and I like to put it in presentations to remind me and to remind people I'm talking to what an amazing environment we live in and, and how beautiful it is here and that we take the time to appreciate that and enjoy it and, uh, and that that's gonna help us as much as any other intervention. So thank you all very much.